Um, so what I want to talk to you about today is um, the role of chromatin loop extrusion in antibody diversification. Uh, and to sort of set that up uh, on this first photo that was taken by a postdoc of mine, Chung Guang Gu, when a whale was uh, going under the boat, uh, it gave him the impression of an antibody molecule. And as I think you probably know, antibodies subunits are composed of two identical heavy and light polypeptide chains. Uh, and the N-terminal portion is the variable region of antibodies. And they're encoded by, for the heavy chain, uh, v, D, and J segments, which are assembled during lymphocyte development to make a very highly diverse set of heavy chain repertoires, and by light chains by just V and J segments. So for background, I just want to give you a, a bit of background to, so I can put it all into perspective. Uh, during B cell development, B cells go through a very set series of developmental stages, and during those stages, they assemble first their immunoglobulin heavy chain variable region genes, uh, and doing that, they first put D segments into J segments, and then V segments into DJ segments. And they do that in progenitor B cells, and all these reactions occur only when progenitor B cells are arrested in the G1 phase of the cell cycle. Once they make a heavy chain, they differentiate into precursor B cells, where they can then assemble their light chain variable regions, and they're just joining Bs to Js. Oops, went too far. So I forget one, yeah. And uh, as we know, like many decades ago, Susumu Tanagawa and, and uh, others discovered the VDJ recombination reaction, and over the years we've learned quite a bit about it, but for many years, up until recently, we tended to think of it in a very simple way well, from this diagram, where Vs, Ds, and J segments are flanked by these triangles, which are recombination signal sequences, which play a very important part of what I want to talk about. And those sequences are fairly generic. Um, they start with a sequence, a heptamer, CACA, GTG, uh, and then that's flanked next by a spacer, non-conserved of 12 or 23 base pairs, and then an AT-rich nonomer. And basically, these heptamers and these recombination signal sequences can only work in pairs to target an enzyme that cleaves the VDJ segments. And they have to be a 12 and a 23 base pair matched, like this, the 12, the 23. And then the enzymes that initiate this reaction, the enzyme, the RAG1, 2 endonuclease, which was discovered by David Baltimore, cleaves precisely between the CAC of the heptamer and the flanking coding sequence. And then, once these enzymes are cleaved, the other half of the VDJ recombination reaction, uh, which we had uh, elucidated years ago, is the classical non-homologous end joining pathway of DNA repair that puts them back together. But the key point is, remember the heptamer and the fact that it, uh, for assays I want to talk about, it's flanked just with a CAC next to the coding region cleavage site. So the real problem for VDJ recombination in terms of thinking about it, and, uh, and, and really we hadn't thought that much about it for many decades, but it's really the question of how the locus is organized and how Vs, Ds, and J segments are embedded over megabases of, of, of the, in this case, the immunoglobulin heavy chain locus, and how they can be joined. So one of the things that helped us understand that, uh, David Schatz and others a few years ago uh, found that, um, found that, that the the immunoglobin heavy chain J's, which are at the downstream part of the locus, there are four of them, and that serves as a recombination center, and the RAG endonuclease binds to it. And in fact, it sits there, and it carries out the whole reaction from that site in the genome. So then how does it find all the V's, D's, and J's that are upstream? There are, uh, a, a, there are about 12 D's and about 80 KB or so DNA. Uh, J's have 23 R systems pointing upstream, D's have 12 pointing downstream, so, and then as we showed years ago, D's joined the J's first. That leaves the DJ with another 12 RSS, and then upstream there are hundreds of V segments that are pointing at the RSS of the J. So remember that convergency, that's an important part of all this. Everything that gets joined is convergent. Uh, and the other point that I'll come back to is there are elements in this locus called CDCF binding elements. There's a lot of them. One end's flanked with them. There's one element in the middle called IGCR1 that has two CDCF binding elements and pointing in different directions that actually Chung Wang Gu, the guy who took the whale picture, uh, discovered in my lab. And then there's lots of CDCF binding elements in the variable region locus all pointing 
downstream. And CDCF are DNA elements that bind the CDCF looping factor, and they bind it in an orientation-dependent manner. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but what Chengguan had discovered years ago is that this IGCR1 element, CBEs, interact with these three sign CBEs, and they sequester the DJ part of the locus uh, in a loop. Uh, so it's all together, the J's, the D's, the combination center that RAG could bind, it's all right there, ready to go. The V's, on the other hand, on the other side of these elements, are somewhere sequestered away. And then the, whoops. How do I go backwards? I don't, is there a way to get it to go back? Back is this. Okay. I just wanted to back to the yeah. previous slide. That's not moving. We need to correct. No, I have to go backwards. No, back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We were working on this beforehand. I thought we had it all fixed. Sorry about this. Uh, can you go back one more now? Back. Just back. Okay. Ah, perfect. That's perfect. Thanks. Just to this. Oh, he did it again. Yeah, there. Okay. So I wanted to, the, the, the key point is um, in the recombination center, RAG, RAG is a te heterotetramer, two subunits at, of RAG, two subunits of uh, RAG2 that are regulatory. The active sites of RAG will bind, for example, a D and a J, and then they will cleave them when they're 1223 matched. And the key point is they have to bind them in the correct orientation to, to, to cut them as well. So that's another thing. They're, they're once again, in the art recombination center, they're convergent. So they get cut, and then they get joined, and then they go on. So now, how do we think about uh, um, uh, how RAG finds its substrate? So years, year, a number of years ago, Jesse, who in my lab developed an assay that I'll mention in a few minutes, that allows him to find out where RAG looks on chromosomes and what it sees from that site where it's stuck on a recombination center. And what he found is that it could scan megabases of DNA, particularly if it's not in an IGH locus, but where you have strong recombination signal sequences. He found that when it scanned the DNA, it would always use weak RSSs, weak CACs, uh, if they're paired with a strong one in convergent orientation. And he found it was, it was uh, stopped at it, these C CDCF binding site borders. So all of that was very similar to a paper that was published just after ours by uh, Lieberman, Aid and, and Murney, where they described the chromatin loop extrusion model, which cohes the cohesin loop protein can bind to DNA. It will extrude DNA past it until it reaches two of these CDCF elements that are convergent, which serve as a very strong loop anchor, and this is the way a lot of the uh, convergent uh, megabase or sub-megabase loops in the chromosome are formed. But we noted that RAG scanning, as he found, was, was um, uh, followed the same principles, which led us then to, to the model that basically when RAG binds a recombination center for the DJs, the way it works uh, is the very first D is part of the recombination center, that can diffuse in. But other Ds cannot access by diffusion, they're too far away. Uh, although people many years thought diffusion can go over long distances in the nucleus, it doesn't. So they have to be actively brought by. So when cohesin extrudes, it reaches the recombination center on one side, that acts as an anchor. And now the other side is free to keep moving and it will just bring the Ds through. Uh, and they will be lined up perfectly for joining. Oh, this thing jumps all over the place. No, it's jumping over my slides. I'm drive really slow here. No, it doesn't want to play my animation. It jumps over it. I need my help again, guys. Uh, or the, yeah, it's, um, it just jumps over the animation. No, we guess. worked on this ahead of time to try to get it. Yeah, it's got to go back. Go back. Yeah. Back. 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 There. Next one. Perfect. <laughs> okay. So, um, this is just an animation. Um, if I get, yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. So, basically, it, the cohesin will hit the combination center. It'll be stopped on this side. 
the Ds get brought through, always being brought through in an orientation that allows them to be joined. If I can get this back. One more time. There we go. I just want to do it a little more slowly. So it's stuck on this side, and when they're brought through, they're brought through so when they go through in this orientation, this RSS is lined up perfectly. The other RSSs on the other side of the Ds are not lined up perfectly, so it will continue just to extrude through. Usually when it gets to this anchor, it, that's the last thing that gets joined. And then um, now you would have a DJ. Hey. Okay. If I get past this one. So then that will give you a DJ complex, but it'll have the loop anchor on the top, and it won't be able to get through. So the big question then is, how does it get through to the VHs? Now, it's, it's hit a loop anchor. No more, no more. Uh, I won't have any more videos of that animation, so I can go faster now. It will, it, once it gets to this end, it now the VJ is a recombination center, and how does it find the VHs, the, the hundreds of Vs that are lined up over several megabases of chromatin? And if you look in the bone marrow of mice and you say, what Vs does it use across that 100 megabases? Uh, it uses all of them in different levels, but very reproducibly. The most proximal ones, a little bit more. So the question we first wanted to ask is, does this also uh, involve scanning and does it involve the convergent rule? So if you turn the V locus around, with, except for the most proximal one, you leave that as a control, will it rearrange them? So you invert this in vivo and it doesn't rearrange any of the Vs. So then the, the, one of the issues would be, well, maybe, maybe it's just, RAG's just stuck there when you invert them and it's not scanning the locus. So that is when you can use this assay that, that Jassy developed which is a VDJ repertoire seek, very high throughput, uh, can see thousands of low-level cryptic events, just these CACs joining when they're matched against a, a, a perfect CAC as they go by the recombination center. So you can see, without having to look at, at, at the, 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 the V elements, what is RAG looking at? And when you do that, um, so RAG scanning, again, is just using CACs across the locus, but only when they're in convergent orientation. So in the wild type locus, you can see RAG scanning, the red, these are all deletional joins of CACs pointing at the recombination center. Now, if you want to know, does it go through when it's inverted, you then just do the same assay and you say, what does it see? But now, in the locus, you've inverted the CACs so that the GTGs are now pointing at the recombination center. And you ask, and you see that RAG, in fact, uses CACs, uses the inverted uh, CAC, G G GTGs, but are now CACs, the mapping is inverted, goes through the entire locus, but in progenitor V cells, it doesn't stop when it gets to the end. There aren't any dominant rearrangements to eliminate all the, the DNA here, so it just keeps scanning, and it scans all the way to the telomere. And it goes through multiple CBE-based domains, and that tells you that something is deregulated in the, uh, in the bone marrow pro B cells that allows RAG to just continue scanning through chromatin domains, which is how it gets past these obstacles. And we looked into what that was, and basically our lab and Meinrad Busunger's lab identified the protein that was down-regulated in progenitor B cells, the protein called wings lock like apart, WAPL, which unloads cohesin from chromosomes. And it was known by others, if that protein gets down-regulated, cohesin can scan longer through domains. So what we've showed and what Meinrad Busunger showed is that, in fact, in the bone marrow, this protein is down-regulated that allows the scanning to proceed over that IGCR1 element and all the way through the chromatin in a very regulated manner. And just uh, without going into the details, this is all highly regulated, but there are Vs across the locus, and the proximal Vs, uh, all these VHs have very weak RSSs, we found, and people weren't aware of that before. The Vs for the, the proximal and middle part of the locus all have CB, CDF elements associated with their recombination signal sequences, and binding of those, slowing the recombination center, slowing RAG down as it scans through the recombination center, allows those recombination signal sequences to be spend time with RAG in the recombination center and get rearranged. At the distal part of the locus, all of these Vs are, are, are highly transcribed in their own germline transcription units, and the transcription slows recombination uh, scan, it, RAG scanning down in the recombination center and dominates their usage. And then there's a way that, they, without time to talk about it, how it's all regulated and balanced so that RAG can scan and use Vs entirely across the locus. Now, the other thing that was always a, pu a puzzle 
that I'll go through fairly quickly here now because I'm uh, running out of time with the, with the problems with the computer, but there are 4J kappas and a kappa locus, and then there are about uh, 100 and some Vs and about a three megabase upstream locus. There are 12, 23 mesh, so the Vs can join directly to the Js. Um, but kappas, unlike IGHVs, some are oriented convergently for deletion, but others, big blocks, are oriented in the other direction so that they would have to join by inversion. And inversional joining would not be consistent with linear scanning, which means that the kappa locus would have to work in a different way. Uh, and the way that that works, uh, we, we found um, by just putting a, a system that has only one single J pointing upstream, so you don't get confused with many different rearrangements, and then asking, how does the locus get rearranged? And uh, in this, the cells that we've studied this in, that single J will rearrange the V kappas across the locus, whether they're deletionally oriented or inversionally oriented, so very different than the IGH. And if you invert the locus, uh, like you did, what you did with the IGH, it still gets utilized across the locus, so it's very different. But now, if you note, they're using these across the locus, but if we use our scanning assay and say, RAG is sitting in a recombination center at the J's, what does it scan to? It does not scan across the locus when it's using these V's. It scans just up to a, a, a CBE-based element called CIS, about 8 KB, and it sits there. So it means it's not scanning the locus, that these have to be getting in a different way. Um, and if we looked at the these, what do they interact with, we find that they do interact linearly with an upstream element called SIR. So basically, RAG sits here, it scans to CIS, the these get brought by past SIR, and they must get in uh, by a mechanism other than just linear scanning. But, and to look at that mechanism, what we did, just to illustrate it, we invert the D recombination center in a, in a B cell line, turn it around so it's looking at the other direction. And, and in pro B cells, of course, when it's in its normal direction, it, re, it, it uh, rearranges across the locus. But if you invert the recombination center, rearrangement stops. Uh, and that's because when you invert the recombination center, while scanning goes across the locus when it's in its normal orientation, it just goes downstream. Uh, so you're like sitting there and scanning in that direction, and it can't use the Ds. But with the kappa locus, it's just the opposite. If we turn the recombination center around, uh, it uses Vs across the locus, but now they're in the other orientation, it uses them in exactly the same order, uh, and it is, is not impeded. But if you look at scanning, it does not scan the locus. It, scanning stops at the, uh, at the SIR element. And, and when you turn it around, it scans downstream, but when it's downstream, RAG is sitting right at this spot. And so it must be getting these Vs by diffusion, uh, unlike the IGH locus directly. And so the question then, last point, where are the elements that allow the locus to rearrange by a diffusional mechanism as opposed to a linear scanning mechanism? So UN Zhang in my lab uh, made cell lines that re undergo VDJ recombination and she made targeted translocations between the heavy chain locus and the light chain locus so that you can now fuse the heavy chain recombination center downstream of the light chain recombination center and Vs and then ask how would the heavy chain Vs rearrange to the uh, kappa light chain locus. And in doing that, she found, unlike in these lines, the heavy chain locus gets stopped at the sir cis element. It can't scan through the locus or use Vs. She found that, in fact, it can now use Vs across the locus at a low level, uh, indicating that the elements that were important in the kappa locus are in the variable region locus. And the idea of what, what they would be, based on other, other uh, um, uh, assays, would be the combination signal sequences or, or the key things that are different. So if she took a J kappa RSS and put it into the IGH locus with the kappa V as upstream, it now rearranged just like a kappa locus, and it could do it in both the deletional and inversional form. And the basic finding of this model is we, we tested and we found that the kappa RSSs are probably 20 to 30 fold stronger than the IGH locus RSSs. And because of that, the kappa has developed a system of recombination based on scanning but not based on linear scanning in a recombination center. Kappas, the uh, RAG binds to the recombination center, it binds to a J element, it can scan just a little short distance up to this so-called, the cis element, and it sits there. In the meantime, the rest of the locus is scanned past the upstream SIR element, and as it scans by, 
it can actually access this, the, the, the recombination center by diffusion, either diffusing in directly or diffusing in, uh, in an inverted form. And the reason it can do it by diffusion is because these RSSs are so strong that when they get there just in a fleeting second by diffusion, they get cleaved and get used. And that, that allows the locus to, to work totally different than the uh, heavy chain locus. So that's the, the basic message of the talk is the, that the, the IGH and the IG kappa both evolve loop extrusion methods to present the variable region locus to the recombination center and to RAG. The heavy chain did it by just running the locus right through the cohesin ring and lining them up perfectly so that it can use impediments to regulate which ones get rearranged. The kappa locus brings them by another element just upstream and allows them to diffuse in. And to be able to diffuse in uh, and get utilized, they had to develop extremely strong recombination signal sequences. So the two loci uh, have evolved these strong sequences in one weak in the other so that one can regulate the process by direct extrusion past the recombination center within a cohesin ring and the other by extrusion near the recombination center where the signals can get in uh, by diffusion. So I'll leave it, stop there, thanks. <laughs>